And good evening from New York. I'm Ali Velshi, and for Chris Hayes, we're watching the continuing fallout from the aggressive anti-democratic power play by Republicans in the Tennessee State House. Now, tomorrow, a local board of commissioners in Memphis, which is in Shelby County, is expected to vote on whether to reinstate Justin Pearson, who's one of two black Democratic lawmakers expelled by Republicans over decorum violations stemming from a gun reform protest that they held at the state capitol after a mass school shooting in Tennessee. As we covered on this show, the other expelled lawmaker, Justin Jones, made his triumphant return to the state house yesterday after a local council in Nashville, county he's from, voted unanimously to return him to fill the vacancy left by his own expulsion. Now, this particular ploy by the legislature was so egregious, a Republican supermajority wielding its power to remove two democratically elected lawmakers on trivial charges that it got national attention and backfired. A new poll out today shows that a majority of Tennessee residents think the expulsions were wrong. And Tennessee is a very Republican state. It doesn't have a single statewide elected Democrat. But because this scheme in Tennessee was so brazen and because voters who care about democracy mobilized so quickly, it was able to become a national story practically overnight. Even amid a very busy news cycle, and because that mobilization was so quick, Representative Justin Jones didn't even miss a day of work. He was expelled and reinstated over the course of one weekend. And while what happened in Tennessee is particularly notable, it's far from the only example of conservative legislatures working quietly to roll democracy back. Just ask Justin Jones. This is a historic day for Tennessee, but it is... It may mark a very dark day for Tennessee because it will signal to the nation that there is no democracy in this state. It will signal to the nation that if it can happen here in Tennessee, it's coming to your state next. And that is why the nation is watching us what we do here. There's no other way to put it. Authoritarianism is ascendant in the Republican Party and state legislatures are leading that charge. In Montana, state Republicans are trying to change how the elections are run, but only for the 2024 Senate race. They're trying to switch that race in particular to a, two, to a top two primary system, which would effectively block any third party candidates from the ballot. It's all part of a scheme to defeat the popular incumbent Democratic Senator John Tester. Republicans think he benefits from the current system, which allows third party candidates to siphon votes from their nominees. Now, Montana's taken quite a few steps recently to roll back Democratic norms. In 2021, the Republican state legislature tried to end statewide elections of Supreme Court justices and instead have those justices elected by district, which of course means the legislature could gerrymander the map in support of conservatives. The same year, they also successfully changed the state's voter ID law to ban the use of student IDs from Montana colleges, making it that much more difficult for young people to participate in local democracy. According to one Republican legislator, her party changed the rules because, quote, college students tend to be liberal, end quote. I love when they say the quiet parts out loud. In Wisconsin, Republicans are already threatening to impeach a liberal state Supreme Court justice who won last week by 11 points because they are worried that she will help overturn the state's abortion ban, as well as their draconian worst in the nation gerrymander. Those partisan voting maps are, of course, in and of themselves inherently anti-democratic, while Wisconsin is essentially evenly split 50-50 between the two parties in terms of voters. Republicans have been able to rig themselves a near permanent supermajority in the state legislature. In North Carolina, Republicans managed to convince a Democrat in a blue district to switch parties so they can achieve a supermajority and override the two-term Democratic governor's veto power. And these are just a handful of examples. There are so, so many more. Maybe you know about some of these. Maybe you didn't. If you did, it may be because you live in one of those states that I've just talked about, or you heard or read about it in the national media. But some of these stories go underreported because local news has been on the decline for years, slowly bled to death by a lack of funding or raided for parts by venture capitalists. A lot of this stuff just flies under the radar. We all know when Marjorie Taylor Greene or Matt Gates say something ridiculous and offensive because Capitol Hill is full of reporters. But what about when a Florida House Republican compares trans folks to mutants and demons like re a representative named Webster Barnaby did just yesterday? To all the folks that are in the audience that consider themselves 
gender dysphoria, um, cis. I don't know what all that means. I really don't know what all that means. I'm, I'm looking at society today and it's like I'm watching an X-Men movie. It's like we have mutants living among us on planet Earth. The Lord rebuke you, Satan, and all of your demons and all of your imps who come and per per parade before us. That's right. I called you demons and imps. That's some crazy stuff right there, but that kind of rhetoric is all over the place within these state Republican parties. Nearly every troubling trend in the creeping threat of right-wing authoritarianism in this country is spearheaded in Republican-led state houses. They get the least amount of attention, both from the media and from the voters. But the fight to save democracy will have to start at the state and local level. Congresswoman Jasmine Crockett is a Democrat of Texas who previously served as a state lawmaker uh, in the Texas House. Ben Wickler is the chair of the Wisconsin Democratic Party. He played a major role in securing a victory for Democrats in that state's Supreme Court election last week. Both join me now. Thanks for being here. Uh, Congresswoman Crockett, good to see you. Uh, you're, you're OG on this, uh, on this topic. You and your fellow Texas state representatives, when you were in the state house, had this kind of thing going on. You had to stage protests and, and activities within the confines of the legislature and the legislative system in order to stop what ended up being a, a first in the nation abortion ban. Yeah, no, you're absolutely right. And and Ali, the only reason that you and I came to even know each other yep. is because of that protest. You're right. I'm listening to to you speak in your monologue and I'm snapping and I'm saying, amen, brother, amen, keep preaching, right? Because that's exactly what it's been. We could not get the coverage, not that we were necessarily looking for coverage, but we want to make sure that our constituents are informed. Most people didn't even have an idea of who their state representatives were. They could tell you who their senators were, who their Congress people were, but they couldn't tell you about the state reps, and they had no idea mm -hmm. that when they were complaining about criminal justice issues, they really needed to be talking to us. They had no idea that an abortion ban was going to be coming down. They had no idea that, you know, what started off as a bathroom bill would then continue on and turn into anti-trans legislation, and they had no idea that the Republicans would be so desperate to bring about voter suppression in the state of Texas that we would flee the state and end up mm -hmm. having warrants out for our arrest and really bring national attention to the issue. And, and I guess that's the point of the exercise. I was talking to, um, to, to Reverend Al the other day, and he was saying, you know, people always say you're just doing it for the attention. And he says, yeah, that's kind of the point. We need to actually get attention on these issues, because when bo voters, Ben, uh, start to learn about what's going on in your state, in Wisconsin, what you found is they actually did respond. Absolutely. They're furious when they find out. But Republicans don't want them to find out. One of the stunning things about politics today is that when you just accurately describe what Republicans are trying to do in state houses in Wisconsin, across the country, voters initially think that it must be a lie because they can't imagine that anyone would try to get away with a power grab so brazen and extreme. In Wisconsin, we had the Supreme Court race. There were millions of dollars of ads. Eventually, it sank in for folks that Republicans were trying to, on the one hand, rip away their reproductive freedom, and on the other hand, smash democracy so badly that voters would have no ability to fight back against it. Their only path for voters to take back control over their own bodies, over their democracy, was to win the Supreme Court race, and that's exactly what they did by a landslide. But frankly, if it hadn't been for this opportunity, we would have been stuck in a doom loop that could have lasted for decades. Back in 1994, the Democrat Jay Inslee was a freshman U.S. congressman representing a central eastern district of Washington state when he voted for a federal assault weapons ban. He later said the vote cost him his seat. And indeed, Inslee lost his bid for re-election as the 1994 Republican Revolution swept a wave of conservatives into office. Nearly 30 years later, Inslee is now the Democratic governor of Washington, and while the national assault weapons ban has expired, his state is forging its own gun regulations. The state Senate just approved a bill that would ban assault weapons in Washington. It now returns to the state house for final approval, and if it passes, it heads to Governor Inslee's desk for his signature. Joining me now is the governor, Jay Inslee, the Democratic governor of Washington state. Governor Inslee, good to see you. Thank you for being with us this evening. Good evening. Good evening. Your uh, your state, this, this, this ban has been introduced in Washington state for a few years now. It's never passed until now. What's changed? 
Uh, well, people have had a, a belly full of violence, gun violence. They understand there is no reason on this green earth why we need weapons of war in our streets, and they've seen their children being exposed to violence in their schools. And now this is a vast, vast majority of Washingtonians and Americans who want to take these weapons of war off our streets. So I'll be signing a bill in the next couple of weeks to, to ban assault weapons. And uh, since 1994, it's been a long road, but thank goodness we're getting there. But this is not the only thing we need to do. We are also, uh, I'm confident, we'll be passing a bill this year to require a safety training course for people before they buy a firearm and have a 10-day waiting period, which will join our other laws we passed in the last year or two, requiring gun owners to safely store their, uh, their firearms. We need to do several things, not just one thing. But the time has come for action. Inaction is not an excuse. We may not solve all the problems, but we can take major steps. And I'm glad I'll be taking a, a significant step in the next couple of weeks. Well, look, what you say makes sense, that the people are fed up, they are, they are prepared to see common sense regulations on guns that do not mean the elimination of the Second Amendment, um, and you're moving in lockstep with where the population is. There are a whole lot of states moving in the other direction, uh, and I don't know whether it's a protection racket that is the NRA that warns people that no matter whether there was a mass shooting in your town or a school shooting, do not suggest anything, otherwise you'll, you'll lose your protection. Why, why are there states, particularly in the southeast, going in entirely the opposite direction than, than your country is, your state is? Well, it has been my experience frequently that politicians have been listening to the NRA rather than their constituents. In 1994, even when I was uh, uh, removed from office, uh, in the state of Washington, there was a majority in favor of this. But the NRA has some political clout, and you have some folks who vote just on one issue, and therefore democracy doesn't work always and that the public will is not followed. But in this case, I am confident that the public will is they don't want AR-15s intruding on their children's schools. And we need to continue to press this. And maybe we won't succeed in every single state in every single month. But every state that follows my state in following democracy and, and uh, addressing common sense gun measures, we will keep this ball rolling, just like we are doing and protecting a woman's right of choice, just like we're doing and moving against climate change. These are the majority opinions of vast majorities of Americans. And sometimes you have to make progress state by state, not necessarily in the congressional field. And the more states to do this, the more it moves the needle, both politically and culturally. And I'm convinced that the, the momentum is now to give our children some measure of safety. And that means passing these common sense measures. You, uh, you talked about protecting a, a woman's rights to choose. You've been in the midst of a, a few major stories in the last few days. You have stockpiled uh, medication abortion, uh, the pill uh, Mifepristone, which might be banned nationwide in a matter of days. Tell me, tell me what your thought process is behind that and what that actually means. If the, if the medication is banned for distribution, will people be able to get the Mifepristone that you've stockpiled? Yes, in our state, because our state had the foresight to stockpile uh, three or four years of the supply of mifepristone, we took possession of that. It was safely in our hands before the judge in Texas, the Trump appointee, issued their ruling. And because of that, we now will be free to continue to dispense this to women in Washington state, even if the Texas judge's decision was affirmed by this Supreme Court. So I can uh, pretty much... Uh, say with confidence, we will be able to continue to dispense this product. We also, as you know, had one federal judge in Washington state yep. uh, actually rule the opposite uh, because of our great work of our Attorney General Bob Ferguson. So we don't know what the Supreme Court is going to do, but we do know that Washington women are going to have access to the MIFA Pristone. I'm glad other states are now joining us in this regard. And I think this is kind of uh, one of the measures as a, an eye opener. We are going to have to be creative and aggressive on a state-by-state -state basis, because those people who would want to suppress this right in women are going to come after us state-by-state. -state. In Idaho, my adjoining state, they're trying to ban the right to cross state lines uh, to exercise the right of choice. And I think this is just an opening salvo, and we need to be aggressive and creative. I'm glad we have. It's going to work, um, and I hope other states join us.
Let me ask you about Idaho. Um, you actually wrote a letter to the governor of Idaho condemning that state's bill that makes it a crime to help a minor get an abortion out of state. In the letter, you wrote, we welcome Idaho's patients and health care providers with open arms in Washington. Uh, abortions banned in Idaho with very rare exceptions. In your state, minors can get an abortion without parental consent. Tell me how this all plays out for you. Do you actually imagine that you're going to see Idaho and fugitives coming into Washington because we've seen what happens in in Ohio when somebody when a, when a minor can't get an abortion, uh, you know, it, 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 it's it's draconian. Look, at, there's a really simple principle here. Idaho can make the laws for their state, but they're not going to make the laws for Washington state. A woman has a right of choice under laws that are determined by our legislature and our people. And those laws apply to activities within the state of Washington. And we are not going to allow Idaho politicians dictate to the citizens of Washington what happens in the state of Washington. This bill attempts to regulate what happens in Washington state. The Idaho legislature does not have jurisdiction in my state, in our state. And therefore, they will not be allowed to dictate who can travel to and from Idaho. By the way, this they attempt to apply this to Washington citizens, too. They try to say Washington citizens who happen to travel in Idaho essentially can't travel back uh, in some sense. So we are going to resist this. Um, I assume there's going to be litigation in some sense. We're, we're going to have to figure out whether we can be a party or just Planned Parenthood. But one way or another, we cannot allow one state to cut off the right of travel in the United States. This is a constitutional right to travel across state lines. And what is legal in Washington will remain legal in Washington state. That's a very important constitutional principle. I got a couple of minutes uh, left. I don't want to start a fight between fantastic Canadian border states. But last night I had Governor <laughs> Whitmer uh, on the show, and she uh, said that if people want to live in a state that respects the rights that they've come to expect, they should move to Michigan. Um, you seem to be doing something in, like that in Washington. You're creating a, a, a safe haven for people who care about gun safety, people who care about abortion, people who care about living their, their best free uh, lives, something that, that libertarians and conservatives used to pride red states uh, for being. Well, we, I mean, we don't. That's I don't get up in the morning trying to create a sanctuary, but we do care about other people. Look, when Idaho and their politicians did, frankly, did not act responsibly during the COVID epidemic, they did not take measures that could have saved people's lives. As a consequence, they had uh, scores of people get sick, and they came over to Washington, and we gave them health care. We treated them. They're Americans. We care about them and their lives. We care about everybody. And we care about the right of choice for all women. So women are uh, welcome in our state, and we will have the means to provide them uh, the right of choice uh, in our state, and that will, that will continue. And these are basically fundamental freedom issues. Uh, we ought to have freedom for a woman's right of choice. We ought to have freedom for kids to go to school and not be assaulted by a weapon of war. There ought to be a freedom to breathe and not be consumed by forest fire smoke because of climate change. So I would say that we are a state that believes in freedom, and others are welcome to come and enjoy it. Uh, I think Gretchen Whitmer is a tremendous governor. She's got a beautiful state, um, and she can come visit us too. So uh, I'm glad to be <laughs> in the party that stands up for freedom Well played right now in this, in this clash. Well played, Governor. And uh, all of you can go to Canada real easily, so that's, uh, that's yeah. good, too. Nice to see you, Governor, as always.